When people hear the word human trafficking, most often the image that comes to mind is probably the movie Taken, where an American girl is kidnapped and brought into sex trafficking in, in Europe, um, which sometimes happens, but also sometimes people think about third world countries, perhaps Cambodian kids, Thailand kids sold into brothels um, in impoverished countries, which also happens. Um, and perhaps if the person does realize that this is happening in America, they may think of New York City, they may think of Atlanta where this is happening, but very rarely is someone's thought process gonna go to the Midwest. But the reality is that sex trafficking and human trafficking does occur here in the Midwest. It occurs in the Midwest, it occurs in Kansas, and it occurs here in Lawrence. Um, professionals and researchers across the country estimate there's about 100,000 minors who are trafficked and exploited on a yearly basis. And that is minors only. That doesn't even count all the adults who are trafficked and exploited across the country. If we know that 100,000 children are exploited on a yearly basis, why would we feel that Kansas or Lawrence is exempt from that atrocity? That doesn't make any logical sense. Last year, the Attorney General's office received a grant, or we received a grant from the Attorney General's office at the Willow in 2014 to provide services to survivors of human trafficking, as well as to provide awareness and education to the community and to create a community collaborative response for this issue in our community. When we talk about human trafficking, there's two different kinds. There's labor trafficking and sex trafficking, but tonight we're just gonna focus on sex trafficking. There are federal definitions and state definitions, and we have laws on the books here in Kansas, and how we define sex trafficking is as the recruiting, harboring, transporting, providing, or obtaining a person for a commercial sex act through force, fraud, or coercion. And when the victim is under the age of 18 in Kansas, they're considered a victim of sexual exploitation, which is, which is good. How we define force, fraud, or coercion is a lot of different things, but some of those things include physical or sexual violence, isolation, withholding of wages, withholding of documents, basically creating a climate of fear for that, for that individual. So anything that's manipulative or coercive that brings them into the commercial sex industry, which is what differentiates sex trafficking from prostitution and the legal sex industry. We define the Commercial Sex Act as anything of value that is given or received for a sex act to a person. It could be to the person providing the sex act, or it could be to a third person, which in this case would be a sex trafficker. Something of value could be defined as, could be money, it could be rent, it could be food, shelter, drugs, anything that is of value, that's how we define that. This is not just a female issue. This is something that affects all genders, races, ethnicities, and socioeconomic classes. This happens to boys and girls, men and women, and transgendered individuals across the country. We do know that the average entrance into trafficking and exploitation is 11 to 14. So that, those are middle school kids, those are high school kids. We know those kids are particularly vulnerable to being recruited and groomed by traffickers. But we also know that some people who end up being trafficked are trafficked starting in their adult life. We have worked with people who are minors and people who are adults um, in our community who have been trafficked. Some of the adults that we worked with were trafficked starting when they were very young and are now in their 20s and 30s and are still being exploited um, and um, manipulated into working in the commercial sex industry. One of the stereotypes is that most of the trafficking that happens in America um, are people being brought into America from other countries. And the reality is that through the Department of Justice, the, the statistic is 83% of survivors are actually American citizens. So the majority of victims in America are from our own communities, they're from our own backyards, they're not being brought in from other countries, although 17% of the survivors are. But from what we've done so far in Lawrence, all of our survivors have been either from, you know, from Lawrence, from Kansas, or from the surrounding states. We haven't had any um, international survivors yet. Trafficking, the, the word trafficking tends to denote that some sort of transportation is happening. And often that does occur. We do see people being moved from city to city and state to state um, and to fulfill the demand for paid sex in other areas. But tra transportation is not required for it to be considered trafficking. Someone could be trafficked out of their house 
perhaps by a partner or a parent. Um, we see apartments and houses being used as brothels sometimes, and transportation isn't necessarily used, but that would be considered trafficking because they were forced to provide sex acts for something of value. So transportation isn't always something that we see being utilized. In terms of traffickers, there are some stereotypes out there, but really just like with victims, we see it cross socioeconomic classes, um, races, ethnicities, um, and genders. There's female and male traffickers. They're not, they're not all men. Um, we also see some traffickers be parents of children. We've seen traffickers be partners. Actually, in Kansas, the majority of traffickers are someone's partner. So maybe they're trafficking their spouse or someone that they're in a dating relationship with, so someone that's intimate partner. We also see relatives who traffic their, their relatives. Sometimes they're strangers, though. Sometimes they're strangers who are known as recruiters and traffickers and will actually go out into the community and meet individuals, maybe at bus stops, at the mall, um, downtown, um, online. There's a lot of different places where these people are seeking out individuals in whom to exploit. And from the people that we've worked with, we have met people that have met their traffickers you know, at seemingly normal places, even a Walmart, um, through a friend while they were living on the streets. So sometimes they're related, sometimes they're not. And there, we also see sometimes that actual pimps are traffickers as well. And these are people who self-identify that way. They call themselves pimps, they believe that's their job, um, and they traffic people, that's, their, that's what they do 24-7. In terms of who we've seen being trafficked in Lawrence, I don't want to have stereotypes because really anyone can be trafficked, but from what we've done so far in Lawrence, we have seen a lot of common themes with those who have been exploited, and I think it's important to know those common themes because that's where we can work more with prevention to prevent this from happening to other people. Um, and some of those common themes include homelessness. That's a huge vulnerability for being trafficked because there's a lot of people in the community who are willing to give someone a bed or some food for a price, and that price is always um, sexual acts. Um, another common theme is that a lot of the youth in particular who we've worked with have run away from home, and it's often been due to abuse and neglect in their home. Um, the statistic out there is that one in three youth while being in the streets in the first 48 hours, they're gonna be confronted by someone who's gonna traffic them. Um, and that is very consistent with what we've heard with the youth that we have worked with here in our community. Another common theme is substance abuse. There's a lot of substance abuse in our community and a lot of times drug dealers are, are, dropping on, are jumping on the trafficking train because it's a very lucrative business. Um, and they're able to coerce and manipulate people when they're in an addiction and using substances. Two last ones are substance abuse in the home by their parents, as well as abuse or neglect in their home or domestic violence. So those are the, the common themes that pretty much every survivor we've worked with have, have had those themes. But I've also met survivors in other communities that have come from really positive homes um, and have been trafficked by a boyfriend who specifically targeted them because that was what they wanted to do. They wanted to start dating that person and start trafficking them. So they don't have to come from homes where there was a lot of difficulties and a lot of traumas. When it comes to where this is happening in our community, a lot of people want to know, you know, do I see it? Am I just missing it? What are the signs? And a lot of the stuff that we happen that happens in Lawrence is pretty underground, pretty hidden, pretty word of mouth. But we do know that trafficking occurs online on sex, sex sites um, where people buy and sell sex, um, in hotels, in those those brothels that are in um, hotels and houses and apartments, uh, truck stops. Um, we've worked with some survivors of street prostitution, um, but not as much in Lawrence. That usually is people coming in from other communities that have experienced that type of exploitation. Um, word of mouth, like I said, is, is really common because Lawrence is a pretty small town, and so a lot of times when the trafficker is a partner or a parent, they're trafficking their victims to people in their sphere of influence. So maybe their friends or their other relatives or maybe their landlord. Um, that's a very common thing that we see um, with the trafficking that's happening in our, in our community. Sometimes the survivors that we worked with were actually recruited from Lawrence to be trafficked and trafficked here. 
Um, sometimes they were recruited from Lawrence and trafficked into other cities and other states. Sometimes they were trafficked in other communities and, and come here. So there's a lot of different ways that their experience has played out. Um, but the common theme is that they were all exploited to some, to some degree. And at the end of the day, the reason why trafficking occurs here, which is why it occurs everywhere, is greed. It's a very lucrative business, and there's a demand for paid sex. And so traffickers, like I said, are jumping on that train to exploit other individuals so that they can make money off of their exploitation. I can't give any examples of people that we've worked with here in our community due to confidentiality, but some examples of experiences that have happened across the state include parents who have sold their kids for sex um, in terms of getting rent and drugs. Sometimes it's a teenager who is dating an older individual, and the older individual says, if you love me, you will have sex with my friends so that we can have some money and we can spend our life together. Another example is a, a teen who runs away, ends up on the streets, and is offered a place to stay in exchange for um, sex acts. And then a really common thing that we've seen in our community is um, drug addicted individuals being recruited by d drug dealers um, into prostitution so that they will make money off of their trafficked individual and then the trafficked individual will get drugs in return. So that cycle of abuse and cycle of violence just keeps continuing and the drug dealer you know, has an easy, an easy way to make money. Some red flags, just so you know things that you can look out for in case you do know someone that maybe this is happening to, or maybe you do meet someone in your lifetime. If they are under 18 and they're in the commercial sex industry, that's a huge red flag. They're a victim in the state of Kansas. If they report working in the commercial sex industry and someone's making money off of them or exploiting them or forcing them to do something they don't want to do, that would be a red flag. Um, if they aren't free to go or come as they please, that is a red flag. If there's any type of psychological or physical control or manipulation over a person, so they can't actually make decisions for themselves, their documents are being withheld, their wages are being withheld, those would be considered a red flag. As well as any sort of debt that somebody has that they ha they're having to repay to somebody else. Um, under threats and coercion, and usually sex acts are required to repay that debt. Um, since we've received this grant about a year ago, we've worked with about 19 survivors of sex trafficking in our community. And that has um, exponentially increased since we received this grant. And we knew that it was happening here, but we didn't, we hadn't reached the survivors yet. There wasn't a, um, an amount of awareness that there is, it's growing now, but when we first received the grant, we knew of maybe one or two survivors. But now we're, you know, we're creating awareness in the community, reaching survivors where they're already accessing services, making sure that they have a voice and know that they're not alone. We've had a survivor who started a support group for other survivors in our community, and that's been a really exciting thing actually, is survivors coming forward and wanting to be leaders in this issue in our community community so that other survivors know they're not alone. And we've also seen survivors starting to refer their peers and other survivors, which is really exciting because they know where these victims and survivors are in the community better than, better than we do. In terms of collaboration, it's really important to us that we're collaborating in the community because sex trafficking is such a huge beast that this is not something that we can do alone. We really have to come together as citizens as well as professionals and governmental agencies and everyone who has a buy-in to this issue, but we really have to work together. Um, we have to keep opening our eyes and making sure that we're addressing all the injustices that people in our community are experiencing, such as homelessness, mental health issues, substance abuse, sexual violence, domestic violence, all these issues that are impacting um, human trafficking and sex trafficking and are making individuals vulnerable to exploitation by traffickers. If you'd only do three things after leaving today and hearing this presentation, I would really love it if you would, one, tell a friend. That's huge because awareness is really important when it comes to trafficking. Victims can keep being exploited if we don't think this is happening in our community. So tell a friend. Intervention, if you see any of the red flags that I talked about, report it. And lastly, 
prevention is really, really important. Every survivor I've ever met said, if I had had a mentor or a positive support system when I was younger, I probably wouldn't have gone with my trafficker. But my trafficker promised me companionship and he promised me love, and that's why I went with them. So mentoring a child, mentoring a teenager is a really great way to prevent this from happening to anybody else. So through collaboration and through work as, as a community, we can continue to make Lawrence a safer place. Thank you.